Good morning and thank you all for joining us for our Becky COVID-19 webinar, The Future of Manufacturing in Victoria. I would firstly like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. In fact, wherever you are joining us from today, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past and present. I'm Paul Guerra, Chief Executive of the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. It's my pleasure to welcome you today in what will be a fascinating conversation about our future in manufacturing. Manufacturing has long been the cornerstone of the Victorian economy and our way of life, providing a diverse range of jobs, boosting exports and contributing significantly to Australia's economic growth. The evolution of global manufacturing, coupled with the effects the global COVID-19 pandemic has had on business operation, has given rise to new opportunities for Victorian businesses to think innovatively, use advanced technologies, expand research, and development and create new partnerships. So with that, let's introduce our esteemed panel of expert guests today, which I'm really looking forward to hearing from. The first is Professor Bronwyn Fox, who is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Research and Enterprise at Swinburne University. Welcome, Bronwyn, great to have you here. Thank you. Next is Dr. Marcus Zipper, and Marcus is the Director of CSIRO, Manufacturing Business Unit. Welcome, Marcus, great to have you join us today. Thanks, good morning. And finally to Michael Edwards, General Manager of Boeing and Mel uh, Michael, welcome. Fabulous to have you here as well. Thank you, Paul, and happy to join my colleagues. Thank you. Wonderful. So just before we start, to everybody out there, you can submit your questions via the Q&A function in the chat um, box below. And if we get time, and I'm sure we'll make some time, we'll ask the experts on your behalf. Uh, we'll get around to as many of the questions as we can. Manufacturing is a $30 billion industry for Victoria, employing more than 283,000 skilled people. We enjoy all the conditions for manufacturing to thrive, including a highly skilled workforce, strong supply chains, and collaborative relationships with our university sector, such as Swinburne, where Bromwood is representing today. Victoria is home to the largest number of engineering graduates in the country. I was one of them way back when, and we spend the most on research and development. With the demise of car manufacturing, many Victorians assume that the sector has disappeared when quite the opposite is true, as we'll see today. It has evolved. We still build things. They're just different things. And you'll hear more about that this morning from our panel of esteemed experts. So with that, let's get underway. I might start with you, Marcus. Pivot, I don't like the word anymore because I reckon it's been the most overused word of 2020. But can you please tell us about what you've and CIRO uh, has helped businesses to pivot their operations to accommodate the COVID-19 crisis this year. Yeah, um, around March when things sort of hit pretty hard, everything went pretty nutso for a while. Um, Australia realised pretty quickly we just, with supply chains being, you know, sort of interrupted that some of the simpler things like hand sanitizer and one, you know, single-use masks just weren't available. Um, and a lot of companies pivoted, and I also don't like that word that much, but they pivoted or adapted very quickly without any need from CSIRO. So they just, you know, we had gin distillers suddenly making hand sanitizer, and it was brilliant. Australia reacted really well, and before we knew it, the shelves were full of hand sanitizers again. There were some particular areas where CSIRO did play a part, and we worked with the Australian government and others on it particularly around masks. So we worked with a couple of companies around um, developing, pivoting their operations to start making single use surgical masks. We also worked with one, one or two companies in making some novel materials for masks that could be used in the future if other materials through the supply chain became disrupted um, using wool and a synthetic material. So tapping into our great expertise in this country in wool, blended with a synthetic material. So that's still being looked at. And the other quick thing was um, you can't actually get masks, surgical masks tested to NADA accreditation using NADA accredited facilities in Australia. You had to send them overseas um, and that took weeks. So CSRO um, reacted really quickly, became experts in mask testing and set up Australia's first NADA accredited mask testing facility. And since then, it's just been a huge amount of um, masks coming through and being tested. It's been great. Fabulous. I love the use of the word nutso in that too, Marcus, as well. So. It's not so. <laughs> hey, Bronwyn, has COVID-19 forced the manufacturing sector to change and adapt in a way that will benefit into the future rather than just for now? 
I think one of the lasting legacies of um, the impact of the pandemic has been that there's been greater collaboration and cross fertilization of ideas than there ever has been before. Companies who I've worked with who have been competing, who have been um, maybe even worse, ambivalent towards one each other, one another, are getting together and working out how they can develop relevant products like the ones that Marcus just spoke about. I know at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a big mobilisation of our manufacturing sector because there was an enormous need to manufacture ventilators. And it was great that um, there was eventually some oversight of how we can better coordinate this, but the willingness to work together is something that will remain long after the pandemic has passed. And that will see us really well set up for the future. Yeah, I know we've talked privately about collaboration and, and certainly that's one of the things I've seen as a highlight over the past sort of six months. Um, it's good to hear you think that'll continue as well. Michael, I, I think a lot of our audience might be surprised at um, the, the size of Boeing um, at their premises in Fisherman's uh, Bend. In fact, I think a lot of our audience may be surprised that Boeing actually has a strong presence in, in uh, on the outskirts of Melbourne. Do you give us a bit of a view as to what goes on at um, Boeing out at Fisherman's Bend there? Yeah, no, thank you, Paul. Yeah, in fact, um, it's probably not well known that the largest footprint for the company outside the US is here in Australia and and, one, and a very significant manufacturing site here at Fisherman's Bend, as you say. Um, so, and, and a very long heritage, in fact, our heritage companies for Boeing date back over 85 years now all the way back to Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation, Government Aircraft Factories, Hawker de Havilland, as those names will be known to many. A history of defence uh, over the last 20 to 30 years, more of a commercial um, manufacturing flavour, and then and then today, uh, almost coming back to a bit of a mixture of commercial and, and defence. Our largest manufacturing work statement is what we call the tr movable trailing edge, the uh, ailerons, flaps for the 787 Dreamliner, um, all carbon fibre manufacturing, but we also make components for 737, 747, 777 here on site as well. There's some particular technology in that carbon fibre uh, uh, area that is that is led from Australia for the company, uh, and we really look at developing that further at scale. Um, you know, th there's certainly been a, a pretty dramatic impact from COVID-19 on the commercial aviation sector, as you know. So we, we're certainly in a in a period now where um, you know there's been some challenges that we're working through here. But for my role in, in the innovation space, you know, we're looking if you like, through and past COVID-19. You know, how do we position to be competitive and continue to grow here in Australia, um, you know, way past COVID-19 impacts, which are going to, you know, probably be here for a couple of years at least. Yeah, great. Um, Marcus, we, we've spoken a lot about food um, through the course of this year, and we've seen examples where, you know, snaking lines outside of um, supermarkets and and um, overstocking in, in some areas. Um we probably don't naturally attribute manufacturing um, to food, but that is certainly that has been a growing um, trend in Australia. Fortunately, Victorians uh, food Victoria's food basin is is excellent. What is the CSIRO doing to improve uh, food security, and, and who are you working with on that? So the first thing I'll say is, look, we all saw in the last two weeks the announcement from the federal government around the. Um, manufacturing, modern manufacturing strategy and the six priority areas and food and beverage is one of them mm. as part of the manufacturing. So that's fantastic, I think. There's 1.5 billion, I think, uh, put towards that initiative, Marcus. Over four years, I think. Mm. So and that's a great statement. And manufacturing is back in, back in town, you know, for everyone. It's high on the list. Um, CSRO has a number of, a lot of work. We have a whole business unit outside of my area in agriculture and food. And we have some great food processing technologies down at Werribee and also littered across other parts of Australia. Um, so we're doing a lot of work with companies and, and industry working at technologies about farmers in times of drought, helping them get the most from their land, their most bang for their buck from water use, how to do that better. Um, we've been producing um, food loss. We've been looking at food loss. You know, about 20% of horticultural goods during production, processing and packaging is lost. So we've actually looked at developing ways to use that um, waste as value add for high value food products, which usually just got thrown away. Another thing we've done a lot of lately is um, work in the protein area and working with um, companies spun out V Foods, 
who's produced, um, you know, plant-based protein products. Some of it's ended up in, in uh, I won't be get into a commercial uh, advertising position here, but there's a famous burger place that makes their, their burgers. So protein substitute is going to be huge for Australia and I think um, the whole re geographic region. So we're doing a lot in that. Look, I could talk for hours about what we're doing, but there's just a few examples. The whole protein um, or the plant-based protein um, is a movement that I caught on to, I reckon, um, probably 12, 18 months ago now. And that's continued to grow in, 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 uh, in its size and its importance to the world. And look, the, you know, parts of Asia and Australia are hungry for protein. Um, you only have things like swine flu, which then, you know, means that um, pork is, it can, be, can be hard to get. So we have to be looking for um, alternatives. Now you can go all the way to start looking at insects yeah. as a protein source. Yeah, it's fascinating where that whole food um, creation is, what well, that food development is heading to as well. I might pick up that theme, um, Bronwyn, in terms of exciting projects. Um, what's the one that's caught your eye this year and, and you know, created new opportunities for business in Victoria? Well, one of the things I'm really excited about is the joint facility that we're building with CSIRO at their Clayton campus. It's going to be incredible. It, um, and it's just, oh, you know, I'm very grateful to Marcus who was able to support it so that we could continue the construction of the building, even when the, the construction um, industry was really disrupted by COVID. And the building's complete, the equipment has arrived and we're starting to install and commission it. It will house a world first process for additive manufacturing of carbon fiber composites the very commercially significant material that um, Michael mentioned earlier they're engineered materials that can be tailored to meet specific needs and they are frequently used to lightweight transport to reduce environmental emissions so that is going to be phenomenal it's it's more than just um, a pilot factory which will mm -hmm. be able to make industrial scale parts it will showcase digitalization and it will be a tangible demonstration of the benefits of digitalization for manufacturing so we're really excited about that um, and looking forward to showing people around when we can um, in my past, I'm, I'm just such a big advocate of public-private partnerships and involving CSIRO in that is really critical as our national science agency. Uh, in the past, I was one of the founders of a facility called Carbon Nexus at Deakin. Yeah. And um, there's just been a recent report that the uh, lead scientist of Victoria commissioned that looked at the incredible benefit that um, the programs that were established around that time, there were a range of them, um, had on the, the local economy and in stimulating a knowledge economy and stimulating economic growth. And the report shows that every $1 that you invest into research returned $3.50 which is quite incredible. And the Carbon Nexus facility catalyzed the creation of a precinct that employed 1,400 people and now has industry co-located with the university and the CSIRO. Um, but I think the most important thing about that facility is the people and the people in that community who are incredibly talented and passionate about what they do and have gone on to start up other companies and they're continuing to, to um, start up new technology and new companies and, and you know, generate that next startup that will grow and become a medium-sized enterprise and then hopefully a, a large enterprise as Carbon Revolution has down in Geelong. It's fabulous. I'm, I talk to the team at Deakin a lot and they you know, use that as one of their glowing examples of the, the partnership. In terms of the one you're um, driving with um, Marcus, when will that come online? Well, um, it just depends on, on how quickly we can uh, install the, the final pieces of equipment. So we are, um, this, the key centrepiece to it is a factory in a box and it has arrived and we can pretty much plug it in and get moving, which is great. The rest of it is part of a three part integrated process and it involves an industrial scale robot and two other key pieces of equipment. That's gonna take a little bit longer to get up and running, but we're optimistic that it will be fully operational early next year. Great, look forward to coming out and seeing it. Uh, Bronwyn, when it is up, I'd love to bring some of the, the Vecchi um, members out and, and actually have a look in and see what's happening out there. So I think it will stimulate a lot more thought as well. Well done. Michael, um, to you, and just before I get to you, don't forget, everybody, um, feel free to put a question into the, the chat box below, and we'll get to those shortly. 
But Michael, you, you touched on um, Boeing and some of the parts that you're building for aircraft. And I, mm. I guess at a time where aircraft isn't flying and, and people aren't travelling as they were you know, even six months ago, mm. where, where is Boeing, you know, where are you at at this point in time um, in terms of investment and expansion? Is that at risk um, because of where the aircraft industry is at? Or have you been able to move into other areas at the Fisherman's Bend facility? Yeah, no, like I said before, um, um, our job really is to be able to uh, look through and past COVID-19 to a significant degree. Yes, there's been, you know, of recent times some challenges in terms of the rates of production that we're now uh, moving to, but, but it's very important that we maintain a balance between uh, a sustainable level of production for us to be able to, you know, meet uh, the, the current sustainability requirements of the company, but also keep the supply chain very healthy. There's a really strong and important supply chain here in Australia, as well as elsewhere around the world, um, and make sure that we, you know, we don't affect the health of that supply chain too much, because there will be a growth of commercial aviation again. Um, I think everyone on this call probably can't wait for the fact, can't wait for the time when they can get back in a plane, not only for business, but for, uh, for pleasure and holidays as well. It's particularly acute in Australia, isn't it? But in Fisherman's Bend here, there's certainly been um, a, a, a quite a significant number of new developments, um, not only just, not just in commercial, but also in defence. And our air power teaming system um, development for Boeing here in Australia, which is an autonomous uh, defence program, um, is the first Australian produced and designed uh, aircraft in more than 50 years. Wow. And it's a very sophisticated uh, program, uh, high performance airplane um, and Fisherman's been central to that. Uh, the, the, all the composite uh, parts that are used on that aircraft are all made here at Fisherman's Bend. It's part of the, the leading technology that we were describing before. Uh, we'll keep building upon that. In fact, uh, in carbon fibre, it's all about uh, low cost, high rate, high production rate opportunities. That's, that's really where we're headed here. And with this defence aircraft, um, uh, uh, we're, we're looking to not only grow it here in Australia and, and obviously for the RAF and, and the capability here for Australia, but also for export. And that's a really important new industry that we're looking to develop, uh, to develop right here in Australia. So I've been lucky to have um, worked in different countries around the world and I've seen this hub type um, approach where you, you get a, a main manufacturer coming in and then a, a bunch of feeder um, organisations off that. Is that what we're seeing at Fisherman's Bend? And and the, the innovation that goes with that. And you, you touched on a little bit there around working with your neighbours as well. Can you give us a bit more insight into that? Yeah, there's actually a few different threads in, in, in that question. One is that there's actually a uniqueness just even within the four walls of Boeing here mm. uh, at, at Boeing Aerostructures Australia. We have co-located on the same site. We have our R&D and innovation group, which is, which is my group. We have our production engineering group, which can harden those ideas and take them into a production environment. And we've got the manufacturing all in the one area. So we're able to really take um, the technologies we're developing here in Australia all the way through to a really mature production uh, case right you know, within our four walls of, of Fisherman's Bend. But um, the, the innovation system and the partners that we've been working with for so long in Australia are so crucial to that success. CSIRO is Marcus here uh, for more than 30 years. Um, the university sector here in, in Melbourne and particularly in our areas of technology strength, including with Bronwyn and Swinburne, RMIT, and then more broadly, uh, where we're now headed in, in Victoria's investment for the Fisherman's Bend Innovation Precinct, which of course we, yeah. we're, we're very keen to, to see come together, um, where it starts to bring in that, that uh, innovation activity across Defence Science and Technology Group, the University of Melbourne and their investments that they're planning for that area. And that really becomes a global hub of excellence that you know, we'll all be able to start growing some of the things that I've described here as business opportunities into, you know, further offshoots and, and further developments of the future. I want to pick the same theme up um, to yourself, Bronwyn and, and Marcus, around, you know, we, we've heard what Michael's doing in, in, in terms of bringing different organisations together, and certainly um, you're both part of that. But 
for businesses thinking about doing the same thing, you know, how would they go about partnering with you know, Swinburne or indeed a university? And Marcus, when I come to you about um, you know, CSRIO, uh, I'll call it CSIRO, it's easier for me, CSIRO, and when we get to that point. So, Bromwood, I might start with you. I'm, I'm, I've got a business, or our audience got a business, and, and they think they've got an idea, they think they could do with some university um, input. How do they go about it? Well, ordinarily, I'd say come on campus and have a coffee, but um, of course, that's a little bit tricky at the moment. But really, it's just about reaching out. And we have many industry partners connecting with us, um, particularly through the work we're doing um, through the Victorian government supported Industry 4.0 SME hub, where Nico Adams, the director of the Factory of the Future, is leading a um, piece of work where he's working with industry to conduct a digitalisation readiness assessment and then working with them to identify any challenges they have and to work on solutions. So we have you know, many different relationships with industry from multinationals to SMEs to medium-sized enterprises. And one of my particular passions is where I can, if we can use our research networks um, globally, where we work with other really industry engaged universities to make business to business connections. And we've done that with a company in Victoria called Imagine Intelligent Materials who have a unique graphene sensor technology. And we've introduced them to Mercedes in Germany and wow. into the broader community over there. So um, we, we love making those connections and just standing back and, and letting them flourish. Fabulous. And Marcus, same question to you. Right. How would they engage? Is it, um, is it easy to engage with um, CSIRO? Look, CSIRO is a, like Swinburne or any, you know, big research organisation or university is big and it is sometimes hard to navigate. So, you know, sometimes you just know one or two of the right people like myself or Bronwyn come to us and we'll help you navigate it, first of all. We'll yep. point you to the right people because we've been around long enough to know who's who in the zoo and where to find the right expertise if you're an SME, for example, we have a, a front door for that at CSRO called SME Connect. That's a team of about 20 people around all of Australia with quite a number in Victoria. They're based in Victoria, the home office. Their role is to connect SMEs with researchers anywhere in Australia, not just CSRO. It could be at Swinburne or any university to find the best match um, to both get the best research for them, but they also can tap into um, funding models and funding grants to actually help fund that research. So that's a one-stop shop in some ways to come in and they will find the best researcher for you. That's their job. Fabulous. Hey, Paul, Paul, can I can I jump in here? Because I think it, for, the, for the benefit of the members online too and the companies uh, like us that are working with CSIRO and the universities, one of the things that we've worked out that works really well with, uh, with, with the teams on the line is um, obviously, we've worked with them for a long time. We get mm. we get to understand where those those really strong capabilities are, and we build we build an investment around those. And when we're developing our longer term tech roadmaps, uh, the things that we want to develop over time, we bring the partners in close. Uh, you know, in confidential uh, and proprietary meetings, we're able to get them on the roadmap. But, but more and more now, we're actually relying on our partners to help deliver for us the sort of developments that are going to be our next programs of the future. Um, now, that, that takes time and it's perseverance, mm -hmm. but, but when you start really thinking about that in terms of partnership and bringing your, your partners such as these in close, trusting them and putting them on, on that sort of roadmap, that's when the delivery in return starts to build upon the value of itself. Really love that theme, um, Michael, because it, it builds on what we've talked about this year's forced us to do, and that's collaborate. Right. And it's great to have a, a strong organisation, but often you can learn so much more off other organisations as well. So to bring the strength of what we have in Victoria together, as you said, under confidentiality, to help the different organisations grow, I, I certainly love that thing. Um, Bronwyn, congrats on the, the 2019 Australian Business Award um, for business innovation for the 4.0 zero strategy that you put together. Can you give us a bit inside what that strategy entails? Well, it's, it's been many years in the making and um, yeah, it's been enabled by our wonderful partnerships. And one of them is our partnership with Siemens in particular, as well as many, many other industry partners and really listening to them and understanding their needs. We've also got great partnerships internationally with relevant industry 4.0 bodies in Germany and Austria. And in fact, we'll have some exciting news um, coming up about Austria in the near future. So we're learning globally as, as well as um, 
applying what we've learned into the Australian context. The strategy is a whole of organisation strategy that we're right behind and it involves everything from um, a higher apprentice program because we do pathways in vocational education yep. at Swinburne all the way through into very advanced research and encompassing our undergraduate training program in the middle. Um, we work with SMEs and multinationals and it really the most, um, we have a, an industry 4.0 uh, test lab that's in the factory of the future at the moment. And this will then be expanded when we open our national facility in partnership with CSIRO, uh, where you will be able to go and really understand the tangible benefits of digitalization. It's very hard to conceptualize if you haven't um, really seen it in operation. And I know the first time I went to a, relative, a relevant uh, test lab in Germany, it was just such an eye opener that I, I just absolutely got it and could see that, see how, um, you know, it was effectively a model manufacturing process for mobile phones, how that could be translated, the learnings could be translated into other products. Fabulous. And I want to keep that future looking theme with um, you, um, Marcus, in terms of trend modelling and forecasting. Let's talk a little bit about what that's showing you in terms of Victoria's prospects post pandemic. Yeah, so we have a brilliant group in CSRO called Sora Futures, who are um, come from a sort of a a, a a foresighting type of background and consulting, where they actually look at technology foresighting and roadmaps for where technology is taking different sectors. Um, we recently did a report, which wasn't partic wasn't just for Victoria; it was all of Australia, um, but it would be just as relevant to Victoria on a post-COVID um, response and resilience. Um, just go to the CSRI website and you can find that report, download it. And it looked at six key industry sectors and the emerging technologies that they'll need in the next 24 months and beyond. So I'll just get the list here because um, they included food and ag, mining, energy, health, manufacturing and digital. And obviously digital and manufacturing cut across a lot of those other sectors all, also. Yeah. Both a horizontal and a vertical. So they're a great group and they do a lot of um, roadmaps and technology foresighting. And I think that's a good place to start. That was released about a month ago. That okay, and that's available online? Yep. COVID Recovery and Resilience at CSRO. You can download it. Yeah, it would be a great place to start if you're thinking about where to go in the future. So you talked about digital and, in fact, you talked about health um, in there as well. Is that something that you're building capability and expertise in as well? Yeah, look... D D digital is everything at the moment, um, but it's a big, digital is a, is a big word and it covers, you know, everything from sensors and robotics, IOT, cybersecurity, big data analytics, AI, ML, you know, you can go on forever. We have a, a number of fantastic areas in CSRO that work in that area. Um, one in particular um, in, is Australian, you know, what's it called? We've got so many acronyms in CSRO, <laughs> you know, you need a whole glossary. The Australian eHealth Research Centre. So, you know, telehealth, for example, was emerging and the COVID situation has just, it's expanded like 10 years worth of expansion in six months. So we do a lot of research in telehealth, which has been fantastic. A lot of work in, in um, using digital imaging for um, different diseases, um, using data analytics and bioinformatics to understand disease um, progression and advancement and how, how you know, um, diseases change over time. So look, digital is really embedded in everything. Either it's a front front of stage tool or it's behind the scenes doing all the all the grunt work. Yeah. So it's basically, you know, embedded in all our research now at CSRO. No, that's good. So there's a l certainly a lot of um, hope and a future, a lot of future thinking going into there. So let's keep with that. Bronwyn, um, to you first, and then Michael, I'll come to you. Um, and then Jess, I'll come to you for um, questions from the audience. But in, in terms of picking up that theme of the future, where do you see jobs in manufacturing into the future? Um, look, I had the privilege of attending the World Manufacturing Forum last year as an attendee, and it's um, this is a bit of a promotion. You can, it, for the first time ever, it's being held uh, virtually this year, so you, it will be have a physical and a virtual presence. And I'm fortunate enough to be on a panel this year. Fabulous. It's it's held in I'm representing Australia, no pressure. Um, so <laughs> if, if anyone wants to give me some um, uh, some of their thoughts, I'd be love to hear them. Uh, 
but they had produced this wonderful document that you can also download from their website where they outlined the manufacturing careers of the future and they were just inspirational. Of course, there's some of the more obvious ones like a collaborative robotics expert. There was an um, IT OT integration manager. So how do you integrate your IT systems with your production systems? And just from our discussions with industry this week, that's going to be incredibly relevant. Mm -hmm a digital mentor, a lean 4.0 engineer, and a digital ethics officer. So um, it, it's just wonderful to get a snapshot of, of where they think the jobs of the future are going to be in manufacturing. And they're, they're just not what um, what we expect. And we, there's probably a lot, lot um, of other roles that are yet to evolve that we'll learn about in the very near future. I'll come back to you in a minute. I'd love to know when the name of the conference, when it's on, and the website. Um, so I'll get you to hand that out in a minute. But Michael, um, as an employer um, in the manufacturing space, where do you see it going in terms of future jobs? Yeah, well, first of all, no, no better person to represent Australia than Bronwyn in, uh, in that field. So good luck, Bronwyn. The, um, uh, it, it, this is really just going to foot stomp a little bit of what Bronwyn was saying. And just to put it into practical terms, we've talked a bit about today things like carbon fibre uh, and advanced materials and so forth. There's definitely a further growth uh, in that area. But to, it, it's really the digital design mm. uh, is really underpinning where we're going to be able to get the most out of our manufacturing environments. That's just not design of structures and the materials per se, it's actually the factory systems, the production systems themselves, which starts to include all the automation aspects uh, of the future. Uh, and Bronwyn briefly mentioned their collaborative robotics. That's something in fact, that from our team here in Australia that we're leading on behalf of the Boeing company worldwide is this is robots and humans being able to work together to take out particularly some of the more dangerous and ergonomically challenged uh, uh, tasks within the factory. Um, all of that starts to bring into, into things like machine learning, AI, and all those digital skills. And it, and it has been fantastic that in the budget last week, even, there's been such a thrust mm -hmm. and underpinning of STEM skill jobs, uh, industry research collaboration. And those themes are going to be really important to underpin, you know, manufacturing of the future in these areas for decades to come, not just years to come. So we're starting to see then, um, Michael, the various parts um, of engineering come together um, to assist all of what we now see as, as a sector called manufacturing. Absolutely. Yeah, no, you, you, you're spot on. And, um, you know, we, we've got in our team here uh, as part of the innovation, uh, real, people working together across all those different themes of uh, structures and materials um, uh, new systems of production, new designs of production and the automation. And they work together in that combined team to really understand how you can design in the right competitive cost as well as the right rate of production for us going forward from the start. And, and in fact, if you think about it, um, what we're able to do now in the digital world uh, and particularly for our new defence uh, platform is we're able to effectively design and make that aircraft a hundred times over in the digital world and come down the cost curve, you know, maybe over a hundred units in the digital sense. So by the time you're making your first physical unit, it's effectively like making 101. And, and you've already come down the cost curve and you already sort of understand what, what it is, is the, the real tricks to be able to get that best benefit uh, out of the development. Fabulous. Uh, Bronwyn, I know you've put the, the conference um, uh, details in the, the chat box there so people can pick up the website, but when is it on? When when are we tuning in to watch you? The, the 11th and 12th of November, bring your pom-poms. Okay. Um, it will be, uh, I, I believe I'm on at uh, from midnight to about 4am, so okay. it's night shift. Bring your right. <laughs> but it's an incredible event. It was so inspiring last year and uh, really wonderful that we have the chance to really participate this year. So for sports nuts like me, we will like watching a test at uh, Lords, I reckon. So I think we can do that. Hey, Jess, um, I see a couple of questions in there, so I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thanks, Paul. And thanks to everyone who submitted a question via our Q&A function. There's still time if you want to get in and pop a question in there and we'll try and get to you. So I'll get stuck in straight away. The first question I have uh, is for uh, Bronwyn. Um, and it is around, uh, you've mentioned uh, the launch of new digital business. 
Um, historically, uh, we've seen some of these startups go overseas for funding and operations. What impact do you see government funding announcements having and what commercialisation support capabilities are available? Um, I guess I've been a, living vicariously through witnessing a number of startups grow over many, many years. And it's been fascinating to witness what makes them successful. And, you know, we often talk about the valley of death when it comes to commercialisation. And it's very real and it's, it's very deep. So I think that government intervention is really important in taking that technology from a lower TRL to a higher TRL. And that's where it makes a business incredibly successful and sets it up for a long and prosperous future that will impact the economy. Fantastic. And uh, that question was from Carlo. So thank you very much for sending that one in. The next question I have is from Sheen, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly. And I'd like to direct this one to Marcus. Um, I'm in the process of establishing an insect farm to be used as an alternative protein for livestock feed and human consumption. Where would you recommend I seek support for this venture? So look, I would suggest um, happy to contact me in the first place. Um, CSRO has just recently launched a new program we're calling our missions program big areas of national significance for Australia where there's major challenges. We have 12 of them and one's completely around protein of the future. So I could connect um, that person with the leader of that area and, you know, see where we can help, whether it's, you know, around a research, development, commercialisation, etc. Fantastic. Yeah, we definitely had another question as well. How can we reach Bronwyn, Michael and Marcus? So I think we'll, uh, we'll look to potentially grab some contact details um, and, and put uh, in an email to all attendees today. So we will definitely work out the best way for you guys to be able to contact our panellists today. I would uh, like, there's a question come through earlier and I'd like to uh, direct this one to the entire panel. Um, and it's around collaboration. Uh, how can collaboration become more organised from grassroots through to large scale businesses in terms of, you know, through the universities, through the institutions like the Chamber of Commerce um, and CSIRO plus employers? So um, how can we do this better? Um, I might start with you, uh, Marcus, then move on to Bronwyn and then Michael, love to get your thoughts as well. So how can collaboration become more organised? Two, two things to start with. I think, first of all, um, we do collaborate very well in Australia, mm -hmm. but not as good as we could. You know, there's a lot of reports that have shown that a lot of companies in the manufacturing space have not engaged with research organisations or other groups. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to do it more. I think you can, you know, go online and look for groups and all that. And, you know, you can have online marketplaces to match people with companies and researchers. But I think like Michael and both Michael and Bronwyn said, in the end, it's about relationships. Yeah. You want to work with people, not just at a technical level good, but people that are, you can trust, people that you can build a relationship with, people that are going to deliver, communicate, you know, et cetera. So um, after the initial thing, I'd say like Bronwyn said, maybe virtually at the moment, but a coffee. You know, so you can, we can listen and understand what their challenges are and their needs are and then help them solve that rather than try and sell them a piece of technology that we think will fit. So from my perspective, I would absolutely agree with everything that Marcus just said, and trust is incredibly important. And if you build up, you know, a trusted partnership, even if you're not actively working together, you can, you've got a network that where you can bounce ideas off people and just um, really understand how robust your ideas are, and that's really important. Um, I think that it's really valuable to have a neutral intermediary, and the chamber can absolutely play a role there. The uh, growth, um, the advanced manufacturing growth centre have, have played a role there. And also the innovative manufacturing cooperative research centre have also played a significant role there. So it does really help if you have someone who is not invested in, in the outcome to negotiate and work out how to best bring all of those parties together for collaboration. Yeah, some good comments there. And I, I, um, the trust and, and relationship comments are certainly appropriate. But let me, let me just uh, go one step further. We, we do try and work to codify some of this ourselves as well and build upon that, the, the good trusting relationships we have. And that uh, Jim Peacock, a former um, chief scientist of Australia, 
uh, and, and a good CSIRO colleague of uh, Marcus's and mine in, in previous life, had a solar system model that he used to describe regularly. And, um, and it, it is all about finding really where those strong, capable um, key technical leaders are, and Bronwyn's one of them in the carbon fiber space for us, thinking of that as the sun and then surrounding with investments and scholarships with PhDs and postdocs and that sort of thing. So you can build a capability up over time that then gets stronger and stronger and we get more and more mutual value from that. So those sort of scholarships that we put in place are very deliberate uh, and, and part of a sort of a codified way of doing that. And then the other thing in the CSIRO case for us is, is um, being able to have someone embedded in our organization, a trusted secondee in our organization that really gets, uh, you know, through those confidential means, a, a real understanding of what our key needs are and be able to translate that back into the business so they can help with us find where those uh, key um, areas are that we want to then go and get that mutual um, collaboration with, with, with CSIRO. And we've been doing that for uh, nearly 20 years now, and it's been such a strong way of, of investing in both Boeing and CSIRO for their growth. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, Jess, and to Bronwyn, Marcus and Michael. Just an inspirational insight into manufacturing. I'm, I'm someone that's an advocate. I think our DNA in this state has been around uh, manufacturing. We've been privileged to hear from the three of you today. And Michael, you touched on the chief scientist for Australia. Well, he happens to be, to be a Victorian as well. So, you know, Dr. Alan Finkel. So we're, we're well positioned actually to leverage you know, more and more off our, our DNA and growing to different areas. And certainly that's one of the things that um, we'll be working with the state government on when we make our pre-budget um, submission over the next um, week or so. So finally, thank you. Um, to yourself, Marcus, to yourself, uh, Bronwyn, and to yourself, um, Michael. Um, very, very engaging and very entertaining, but most of all, very informative. And Bronwyn, we look forward to seeing you on the 11th and 12th, and we'll make sure that um, I'm up, and I, I do look forward to watching you there. So I appreciate every, all three of you giving up your time today. Okay. Becky's webinar series delivers support and practical advice from experts, as you've seen today, across the board on a range of business challenges that you're facing or may face as we come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. You can catch up on all our previous webinars, and this will be on there over the next couple of days as well at our website, which is www.victorianchamber.com.au. Keep an eye out in your inbox for our next webinar event. It's been jam-packed this week, um, highlighted by this one as well. And just finally, before you go, with a grand final not far away, together with Picture Partners, Becky will again be presenting our grand final lunch. But this year, it'll be one with a difference. We show that it'll blow you away as we hear from guests like Nathan Buckley, Trent Cotchin, AFL CEO, Gillian McLaughlin, Dennis Committee will be dropping in, Mike Brady will be there, singing up there, Kazan and a few others. Even Eddie McGuire is going to... Um, channel in from uh, Brisbane as well and there'll be some other personalities in there all hosted by Hamish McLaughlin and Daisy Pearce we're also expecting international guests as well so you'll have to tune in to do that to see who that is you can watch it from home or your office grab the family if you can kicks off at 12 30 next Tuesday the 20th and tickets um, will be available at minimal cost via the Becky website, which again is www.victorianchamber.com.au. 800 registered so far, so don't miss out. Everyone at Becky looks forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you again to our guest today. Thank you for tuning in and hopefully see you soon. Have a great afternoon. Mm -hmm.